Aloha Mai Kako ALA members and welcome to the 2024 ALA Presidential Candidates Forum. My name is Lessa Kananiopua Palaio Lozada and I am ALA's immediate past president. And I am so pleased to be moderating today's forum. With me is Adrian Stratton, ALA parliamentarian and ALA governance staff who will help me moderate today's forum. The floor will be open for questions from the attendees. Members were also provided the opportunity to submit questions prior to today's forum. There are two methods to formally ask a question or make a comment. You may either type your question in the Q&A box, which will be read by ALA staff, or you may raise your hand, which is at the bottom on the screen. We will recognize and unmute you so that you may verbally share your question or comment. Attendees will always be virtually muted other than when recognized. To identify yourself, please state your name, your affiliation, and your question or comment. The chat feature will not be available today. For optimal viewing, we encourage you to set up your Zoom view to speaker view, which can be located on the top right-hand corner of the Zoom webinar. Closed captioning is available at the bottom of your screen. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on ALA's YouTube channel. For the forum today, we have asked each candidate to give a five minute opening statement. After the candidates have given their presentations, the floor will be open for questions from the audience. All respective candidates will be given two minutes to respond to each question. The forum will end with each candidate presenting a two minute closing statement or summary. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to the presidential candidates for the 2024 ALA election. The 2025 to 2026 ALA presidential candidates are Sam Helmick, Community and Access Services Coordinator at Iowa City Public Library, and Raymond Pun, Academic and Research Librarian at the Alder Graduate School of Education in California. Please note that the following presentation order for our presidential candidates was determined by lot. First, we will hear from Ray Pun, then Sam Helmick. I will now ask presidential candidate Ray Pun to present an opening statement. Thank you, Lassa. ALA members, thank you for making time to hear both Sam's and my vision for the ALA presidency. I'm honored to run for this important role, and I want to start off with a story first. As a child of immigrant parents, I grew up speaking only Chinese at home and English outside of home. I was often placed in ESL and remedial reading programs. Imagine being unable to read or speak as a child. But my local library in Queens, New York, was always there for me, where I visited every day to improve my literacy skills. I eventually became a first-generation college graduate. I share this story to highlight how libraries transform my life as well as our community's lives for the better. For almost 150 years, ALA has been recognized as the world's first and largest library association. But ALA has not been without its flaws, including its history of exclusion, particularly regarding underrepresented groups. ALA now reckons with its past to build a better future in its spouses. Inspired by past ALA leaders' visions, I strive to ensure that ALA continues bridging and advocating for communities through libraries and library workers. Libraries transform lives for the better. I'm honored to be considered for ALA president, and I have three goals building upon what we're experiencing today and what leaders have worked on. First, we must support and showcase library workers our colleagues, all of us in this call and watching as we confront unprecedented challenges such as censorship, climate crises, AI, surveillance, job burnout, workplace safety, digital content price gouging, and more. Librarian and author Audre Lorde once said, quote, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives, end of quote. Addressing these issues affecting us and our communities in a national forum through ALA can unite us to affirm one another in community. Second, I strive to build a stronger working relationship between ALA, ALA organizational and individual members, 
state chapters, and affiliates, recognizing our mutual support for one another, especially on advocacy work. We can collaborate to collect data and share our community stories about how they benefit from ALA's efforts in securing funds from IMLS, LSTA, and other partnerships. As a community, we're experiencing an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. Nearly three in five adults and two in, in three young adults experience loneliness, according to Morning Consult data. Social media has amplified false connections, and we need to reposition ALA as a community where we can learn and grow together professionally and personally, and to highlight that you are not alone because we are facing these issues together. Finally, I aim to expand ALA's engagement with the global library community through virtual orientations and programming. This will support our international members and recruit potential members to be part of ALA. Locally, our colleagues may benefit from participating in these programs to better serve groups like immigrants and refugees. This is based on my involvement in the ALA International Relations Groups and IFLA. Working together with you all, we can achieve many things. For the past 17 years, I've worked in public libraries and academic libraries in America, in China, in various positions, from a student worker to a library assistant to a librarian. Today, I proudly serve teachers, teacher educators, and grad students. I've held leadership positions within ALA, ACRL, National Associations of Librarians of Color, and IFLA. I've also served on national to state chapter committees advocating for library funds and more. As a teacher educator and an academic librarian and former public librarian, I'm committed to advocating for all library workers and library types. As the president of the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association and the Chinese American Librarians Association, I forged local and global coalitions, such as making connections to ALA Unite Against Book Bans campaign. We also streamlined governance processes through transparency and increased fiscal health and membership through fundraising and engagement, especially during COVID-19. I also co-obtained IMLS funds to support leadership development and networking for underrepresented groups in the field. Cultivating meaningful connections among our volunteers is purposeful work. I will bring these same successful leadership and collaborative skills to my duties as ALA president. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ray. I will now ask presidential candidate Sam Helmick to present an opening statement. Thank you to everyone who worked to put this forum together, particularly Cheryl Reyes and ALA's governance staff. Thank you to Lessa Kanani Apua Palaya Lazada for moderating, ALA's parliamentarian Adrian Stratton for bringing structure to all governance meetings. And thank you to my fellow candidate, Ray Pun, for standing for election with me today. My name is Sam Helmick. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a non-binary Christian library worker in the conservative state of Iowa, and it is with great honor and excitement that I stand before you today as a candidate for ALA presidency. This week, library advocates defeated a bill which would have eliminated all codified funding for public libraries in my state and closed several small and rural libraries serving marginalized and vulnerable populations. But Iowa workers galvanized to ensure state library, uh, state legislators heard us through media coverage, phone calls, emails, and may I thank you, ALA, for access to one-click politics, as well as advocacy training for over 700 library trustees across the state this week. The subcommittee heard us. They canceled their public comments meeting. They listened to our feedback, and they chose to table the bill. My experience activating affinity groups in media, law, social justice, and community action launched a campaign that made this happen. I want to bring those skills and experience to my role as ALA president because we know chapters are doing tremendous work right now on the ground responding to book challenges, threats to the safety of library workers, personal attacks, and legislation aimed at dismantling libraries. I know firsthand that these struggles will require grassroots organization and mobilization. Strengthening ALA's chapters is the priority of my presidency. By directing resources to the ALA's chapter relations office, increasing training for chapter leaders and members on media relations, power mapping, advocacy campaigns, but also raising awareness and access to the existing resources ALA provides. 
As your ALA president, I will work tirelessly to ensure that our chapters are connecting with the efforts of our divisions, roundtables, committees, and affiliates because we do this good work together, and ALA has provided us with the tools, resources, and opportunities to do it. Over the years, I have held the privilege of serving on roundtables and committees for the Libraries Transform Campaign, the Young Adult Library Services Association, the Rainbow Roundtable, the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable as president-elect, as well as a chapter counselor and president of the Iowa Library Association. And now I am an ALA executive board member and have been working to advance the mission and values that bind us together as an association across all types of libraries. As your president, I would bring a clear vision to support the work of the executive board and hiring and guiding the next ALA executive director. This pivotal role will require a leader who not only understands the challenges facing our profession, but who also possesses the skills necessary to champion the voice of membership and guide our association into its future. My commitment to intellectual freedom will remain unwavering. As a knowledge expert in First Amendment privacy and access policies, I will work with school boards as I always have, as well as public libraries, major library systems, but my fellow professionals to uphold the principles of intellectual freedom and access because we have a right to our stories. We know that Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as LGBTQIA representation in education and libraries is crucial to learning, belonging, and our very right to exist. Any conversation about intellectual freedom must be intersectional and include the people whose stories, identity, and safety are under attack. Our library stories are powerful. Our library stories inspire joy. It is essential we play joyful offense against unmitigated censorship, mischaracterization, and privatization that is competing with our profession. We do that by sharing our stories, by taking a proactive approach and seizing opportunities to promote the value of libraries to effectively combat censorship and challenges to our profession. We need to hear more of the positive stories that are happening every day across libraries. Today, I come before you not only as a seasoned leader in the association, but as an ALA member who has been inspired by the many leaders who have come before me, past presidents Ann Simon, who models inclusive leadership, and Julius Jefferson, who is steadfast in his commitment to the membership and all of his work for ALA. I am indebted to the many current leaders who give me the example to raise to. The confidence and clarity of President-elect Cindy Hull is demonstrated every single time I talk to her, and I am especially inspired and influenced by the bravery and integrity of our current president, Emily Drabinsky. Together, let us continue the transformative and important work of the American Library Association. We do this work together. I humbly ask for your vote, and I thank you. Thank you, Sam. We will now take questions from the audience. Again, if you wish to ask a question, please type the question in the Q&A or raise your hand by utilizing the raise hand feature. We ask audience members to specify whether questions are directed to a specific presidential candidate or both. When you are recognized, please state your name and institution before asking your question. We will do our best to answer all questions. However, if time does not permit, then we encourage you to attend the 30 minute meet the candidate session immediately following this forum to connect with the candidate. Please also check out their candidate website. Their information has been provided in the chat by Holly. Marsha, let's go ahead and get started. Please read a question that was submitted in advance. This is from um, ALA member Lucia Gonzalez. How do you envision a strategy that would address issues related to the politicization of censorship that has placed ALA in such a predicament that affects our organization's reputation and aims at undermining our core values. I will first ask Ray to respond and then Sam. Thank you for that question, Luz. It's such an important one where we are seeing a lot of challenges as Sam and I spoke and mentioned. The censorship issues is rampant and it's affecting so many library workers in different ways. And so I feel for, for those who are affected. So I think there are numerous opportunities to engage with stakeholders in addressing this to issue together. So ALA, we have an opportunity to partner closely with our state chapters, our chapter relations office, and provide a lot of support in media training, letter writing, op-ed, anti-doxing, 
because a lot of that information from our colleagues are being leaked and, and they're being attacked and we need to partner and to offer these resources. But that's not just it. We need to really support ALA internally. It's a crisis mode right now. We need to consider expanding the media and communication office with a public relations crisis expert to look into this and to solidify those communications with different groups like the state chapters and the affiliates because these issues, as mentioned earlier, is quite intersectional. And I think it's also important to think about our partnerships with authors, illustrators, and our publishers. This is so important and it's the work I've done collaborating with Simon & Schuster and collaborating with author Kelly Yang to highlight book banning issues and, and what they're seeing and how they're engaging with that. Together, we can do this. It's all about collaborating in strength. And with that, there's something internal we need to look at, that communication flow to address the censorship issues, offering trainings, connecting with the state chapter leadership, providing resources to the Office of In for Intellectual Freedom, as well as chapter relations and media and communications office. And so I see the partnerships externally, as I mentioned, with these other groups at a grassroots level, because we can provide the resources, but it has to take that conversation to make it happen. And it's long term. It won't end even after this uh, cycle, unfortunately. Thank you, Ray. Sam? This is an excellent question and speaks directly to the heart of the joyful offense that I know is essential. My background in Iowa saw the second most library adverse bills in the nation last year. Um, I'm not sure you get a championship belt for that, but you do get a lot of lessons in building coalition. And that coalition has to exceed outside of libraries. We need others telling our wonderful stories and we need to be able to amplify and uplift each other. So as a chapter association president, I would recommend that we, we acknowledge one profound truth. We are at a two front engagement. The first one is a cultural dispute with the books on our shelves, the voices that we amplify and uplift and support and represent, our meeting rooms, our story times. But that is slightly being used to distract us from a class war that is taking shape to dismantle all publicly funded institutions. So I think it does benefit us to think about our affinity groups who can support any community anchor institution, which is essentially what libraries are. And that starts with local. It starts with conversations and op-eds in your local newspaper. It starts with making sure that we are activating and galvanizing our chapter relations and the mechanisms they have in place for government affairs. But then it's also applying ourselves to the wonderful amenities and resources that the chapter relations office has already provided for us. One Click Digital posted a House Senate file bill for me, a, an action point last night, and I already have 297 signatures. So I am really excited about the opportunity to repeat the advocacy training that the chapter's already accomplished in December at its inaugural event and leveraging that to ensure that we have ACLU, we have like our Progress Iowa compatriots in other states, we have groups like Annie's Foundation uplifting and doing this good work together. Thank you, Sam. Raymond, will you please unmute the attendee with their hand raised? Yes. John, you should be able to unmute now. Um, if not, we do have another hand raised and we can go to Sarah Dallas. Sarah. I'm so sorry, <laughs> but while I have this, I wanna thank everyone who made this possible and thank you, Sam and Ray for standing for office. I apologize. That's okay. Uh, we'll check on the hand raises and we can move on. Great. Thank you, Raymond. Marsha, can you please read a question that was submitted in advance? Yes, this is from ALA member um, Ed Garcia. ALA will be celebrating our 150th anniversary and we'll be launching a major fundraising campaign. As president and as a member of the executive board, you'll be expected to be active in that campaign. Please describe your experience in fundraising. Sam, please answer first. 
Thank you, Ed, for that great question. Fundraising is always telling a story. We want to give somebody something to believe in and to have their fingerprints on. And so the stories that I've been able to tell are on the YALSA Fundraising Task Force when I first began my work in the association. And then additionally, as like a community college campaign um, worker and then also just through libraries. So I love telling library stories and advancing the, the permission and the um, the role of what we um, are called to do, but I would suggest that we need to look at this structurally and think about the human capital that can be applied to it. So I've been looking as a fiscal officer on the staffing structure of ALA, and I, I remember that at one point we had an executive director and we also had a director of development. And when I think about the human capital that is going to be required to connect across divisions to share those stories and that message to be fiscally healthy and budgetarily sound and to raise money going forward to ensure that we sustain as an association, I, as your ALA president, would encourage us examining that model again um, and supporting the board and the executive director and applying themselves to a, a sustainable staffing model that would enable us to, to fundraise at a level that is going to be relevant for us as an association. Thank you, Sam. Ray? Great. Thank you so much for your question, Ed. As a huge proponent of fundraising, I have seen the opportunities there where we can really engage and celebrate all the amazing work we've done at ALA, 150th anniversary, and still have a lot more to go because we want to continue honoring the community that we have built together. And so my fundraising experiences range from the work I've done through the Joint Council of Librarians of Color for the JCLC conference in 2023, that was last February, last year, where we had worked together to cultivate over $200,000 to celebrate the work we're doing as library workers of color to celebrate diversity, equity, inclusion in a space, an inclusive space for all of us. And so I was really honored to do a lot of fundraising, including a talent show, a silent auction, a lot of other um, opportunities for gaming nights for people to contribute, right? So there are different ways to really get people in this community. Maybe they haven't heard about JCLC or the other NALCOs, but they certainly were able to be participating and seeing the, the potential of our work together. And most recently, I have served as the president of the Chinese American Librarians Association's 50th anniversary at that time, and have fundraised over $5,000 and brought us back in, an, in a space where we can celebrate our 50th anniversary virtually and in person with publishers and authors. And it was great touching base with all these vendors who wanted to celebrate Asian American experiences and stories. And most recently, also with the Association of Research Libraries, the ideal conference that's coming up. Working together in a team, we were able to fundraise over $200,000 celebrating this conference, bringing people together on equity, diversity, inclusion in academic and research libraries. So I have been a huge, um, a, a huge proponent in fundraising efforts. I would love to bring that experience into ALA's 150th anniversary to continue the good work we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. As a reminder, if individuals wish to ask a question, please type the question into the Q&A box or raise your hand by utilizing the raise hand feature. We'll next take a question from Inti A. Dewey with Denver Public Library in Denver, Colorado. For both candidates, what are your thoughts on the states leaving the American Library Association? And Ray, we'll start with you, please. I'm so glad you asked that question. And it's one that we've been all thinking about quite a bit, seeing the news after news and not showing when it'll stop or what will happen. It's, it's quite frightening times, especially for our colleagues based in those locations and not knowing that their associations or their libraries are questioning the, the importance of ALA. And so what we see are a few things that's connected to the questions of censorship, the issues that are going on in this country, but we have to be, proactive. We have to have opportunities to engage. This is where I believe we have opportunities to think about what we're doing and think about where we want to go. So we see these decisions that are being made or that have, made, that have been made already. Can we think about ways to amplify what ALA has done in partnerships with state chapters, with state libraries, whether that's with the chief officers of state library agencies, COSLA, and to, to gather those stories that highlight what ALA is, has done in support of securing funds from IMLS or LSTA 
so that people can see in an infographic, in multimedia digital storytelling, something that tells them that there is an organizational benefit to being part of ALA's community. And so I think we, we can ha have these conversations through our communication and media team, as well as partnerships, because this issue uh, requires us to, to have opportunities to uplift these stories and data that are out there. And I see IMLS does a really effective job in showcasing their impact and visualizing what their grants have done for the communities. And ALA can do that too, because we have so much potential. We have done so much work. And I think there's room to continue engaging with all these different groups to highlight. And so when people are going to hearings or when they're writing op-eds or they're engaging with their stakeholders, they can show in a one pager what ALA has been able to accomplish with the communities together. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Sam, please proceed. Yes. As your ALA president, I would lean into my work as the chair of the Iowa Governor's Commission of Libraries to remind us that the associations, the professional networks, our chapters are not leaving. It is the state agencies. As a chair, I actually had to, to help save IMLS dollars for the state of Iowa on two separate occasions because as a fundraiser on the federal level, from 2016 to 2020, we were given a budget of zero dollars from the federal level and had to not advocate for more, but advocate for same. And it really gave me an insight on the role of state libraries and how they are being unfortunately politicized, but they have always been state agencies that can only do much too, so much to promote the professional development of our profession. So I think it's an important distinction to make and to, to, collect, like, to correlate to my experience as a president of a chapter of association and to lean into, again, those joyful stories, allow ALA to shine, to remind folks of the millions of dollars in awards and grants and free training that we are able to offer this great profession throughout the the entire country and world and to um essentially again share share our stories as your president it will be my job to isolate some of those great stories especially in areas that are are, are being isolated from the herd right this is a hunter mentality where our our professional networks are being stripped from each other and i think this is a place where ala can step up and shine and brag about ourselves a little bit and the excellent work that we do and often i think that's going to happen through the chapter relations office but i think it's also going to happen through ala apa and talking about the great data and um, value that libraries bring to communities every single day Thank you, Sam. Marsha, please read a question that was submitted in advance. This is from ALA member Dulcie Smith. If elected, how would you strengthen ALA APA to better support library workers, in particular, reducing precarity, increasing pay, and supporting unionization efforts? Sam, please start. This is an excellent question. On the executive board right now, I serve as the liaison to ALA APA. And as your president, we would be presidenting both, right? And I, I've been thinking about this question for a long time. I think that the data and the curation of workplace wellness are two places we can hit a couple of notes that need to be addressed. So for instance, um, we have to bake wellness and support of our of our staff into the recipe. At the Iowa City Public Library, we just finished our strategic plan and wellness was the fifth of five pillars. And what that did for me was it allowed me to, to justify to our stakeholders, to our taxpayers, that paying for committee work, paying to be sent to conferences and supporting workplace wellness actually supports the institution. It supports the sustainability of the institution and also just the robustness of our, our staff. And so once I was able to connect those values, we were able to provide resources, which would require reporting, which would require implementation. So I see the work of ALA APA kind of tackling two places, acknowledging that adequate pay and support to our library workers, whether it's their nine to five in their institution or the professional development work they do to uplift this profession should be compensated and that we can have data curated to, to provide that and amplify it. But then I think it's also creating structures and training the trainers on how we ask our leaders, those with privilege to extend out the hand to support those 
those in the profession who are not being adequately compensated for the work that they do. And some of that's going to look like a strategic plan where we pay our staff to do the professional development work that enhances the home institution. So advocating for that is going to be a presidential goal. And I'm excited about the test pilot that's happening in my home institution. Thank you, Sam. Ray? Thank you for that question. And I wanted to share with folks that when I was at the New York Public Library, I was thinking about this question of, should I be joining as a union representative for the research libraries? And I was encouraged by so many folks because I saw opportunity to connect and support our library colleagues who may or may not have an MLS, but who are part of the union. So a shout out to NYPL Guild 1930, DC 37, and it, it taught me a lot about what it means to organize, to support our colleagues with pay, pay and differences and so forth. And so I think about the questions that we're, we're hearing right now, which is how we can uplift these issues in a way through ALA APA, as it was mentioned. It's a companion organization, a 501c4, compared to ALA, a 501c3. And I know this has been part of some of our past presidents and, and current presidents thinking of building up this important companion association with the same presidents and board and members, et cetera, or staff. And so what I see is an opportunity to expand um, some offerings there, whether it's a webinar that just happened last month, uh, organized with um, one of the committees at ALA, focusing on the status of women in librarianship, and then ALA APA to highlight the gender pay disparities. Can we do an online summit? Can we consider a conference online just on looking at mutual issues affecting library workers? I certainly believe so. We're seeing an exodus of so many folks retiring, resigning, burnt out. There has to be a space for us to, to talk about these issues in a safe space where we can support one another and strategize how we can continue doing this work. Because at the end, it's our relationships that, that, that build us together, that keep us together. So I see opportunities in supporting this ALA APA to address some of these concerns because it matters to all of us and there's opportunities uh, to, to be so Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Next, we'll take a question from the Q&A from Elizabeth Joseph. How can ALA engage our colleagues who are not ALA members, but are incredible contributors to our industry and profession with a note that membership costs are prohibitive? And we'll start with Ray. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It's good to hear from you. And I wanted to share that there are a couple of things I've been thinking about that resonates with what people might be experiencing. So we have the membership that is set on annual or semi-annual subscription, and that might be expensive. Not everyone can afford ALA membership right up front or halfway in the year. Perhaps there are some opportunities to explore monthly subscription, right? And so when there's monthly subscriptions, maybe there's a way to reduce that financial financial burden so that people can feel engaged on a month to month basis. And I know there's probably some investigation happening. So I hope that it comes to fruition. And I think when I when I think of ALA, and I hope everyone sees this too, we think of ALA as that resource that supports so many personal and professional opportunities. I see ALA similarly to PBS. I'm a huge fan. I think PBS has done an extraordinary work in engaging with the public, with supporters, and ALA, we continue doing that, offering a lot of webinars and support. But that also means that we need to recognize the labor and the time we put in. So I see, for example, what the Association of College and Research Libraries recently approved, the, the board, which is um, honorium uh, pay for ACRL speakers. That could be potentially a way to uh, recognize the labor involved in offering professional and personal developments within our community. And so that people can feel more engaged and see that they're also being part of this community to grow. And, and I also see opportunities to engage with different groups like the affiliates. I'm part of all of that, most of them, right? For the most part, especially the National Librarians of, of Association of the Color. And I see more collaborations happening that can really benefit folks who may not be part of ALA, but are part of those groups so that we have mutual interest and shared space where we can talk about the issues that matter to all these associations involved. So there are more collaborations needed and our work is continuously building those relationships and ensuring ALA is there. Thanks. Thank you, Ray. Sam? 
This is an excellent question because we need engagement on a couple of fronts, right? We need engagement fiscally to support the, the association and make sure that it can be sustained for another 150 years. I agree with Ray that engaging the public in this work is going to be what it takes um, because this work influences and impacts the world around us. And so giving them an opportunity to put their fingerprints on this and to engage in that work, resource that work and support that work is going to be fantastic. I would love it if the president for the 150th anniversary could come out like a PBS campaign and say for $150 a year, you too can support free people reading freely around the globe. I think it's also fascinating to think about the structure of this. Um, I imagine that we would approach this in three different ways. The first one is how do we how do we approach ALA support? Again, I go back to the answer of the ALA APA answer. You know, like we we really need to be talking about this at an advocacy level and impressing upon our institutions that we bring value. Their staff brings value through the work that we do. So we need to be resourcing it and creating advocacy pathways that enable institutions to understand that they should resource this work, that it is part of supporting the human capital of their institutions. But it's also in the way we do approach the public, sharing our stories, playing that joyful offense, enabling them to act on our behalf by sharing sharing our stories, contributing their own stories, because that has value to the association as much as a, a monetary donation might for especially some of our, our, um, our groups who don't quite know where to pay, what to pay, what to contribute to, but I can give you my voice, I can give you my time. And then I think it's the third way is it's we approach the work in a, in a structural fashion in that boy, I just, in 150 years, I want to be here again. And so I think that the lens of sustainability and doing doing the essentials right now needs to always be our primary focus. And I think that we need to hold space for new members. Thank you, Sam. Marsha, please read a question that was submitted in advance. Um, this is from ALA member Bridget Kamsler. What ideas do you have to strengthen member engagement and strengthen the effectiveness of ALA governance, that is council executive committee? Thank you, Marcia. And Sam, please start. I apologize, my internet cut out. Could you please repeat the question? Sure. What ideas do you have to strengthen member engagement and strengthen the effectiveness of ALA governance that is council executive committee. Yeah, I think this is tied to advocacy too. I think that my outreach and public services librarian experience reminds me that we go out to the communities and we show our value first. We show them what we can bring. And I can tell you the ALA Governance Institute is incredibly valuable. The board effectiveness that has been the lens of all of the membership leadership work that we've been doing, particularly under LESA and the executive board, has influenced and informed the work that I take back home to my chapter association, but also in the leadership that I do as a library worker. So I think that creating those opportunities for full membership, engaging with the new members roundtable, the emerging leaders and the spectrum scholars to show that value can be taken back home to the home institutions. And then they'll recognize why giving new members things to do has always been part of ALA. We've always, we've always said, if you roll up your sleeves, we have a space for you. But I think we need to impress upon the institutions that they need to fund and resource it and support it. I also really think we need to lean into our intersectionality, accessibility, diversity, and inclusion core values to examine how we are are engaging in that work and are we mindfully extending the hand across the table and inviting folks to not only do the work but to feel satisfied in the work and then to continue to find their own path in the American Library Association and everything that it can offer us. Thank you, Sam. Ray? Great, thank you so much for that question. I wanted to share that from my experiences having been presidents of two nonprofit library volunteer associations. So the APALA, the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association, and KALA, the Chinese American Librarians Association, I saw an opportunity to really revamp and engage in governance uh, structure and engagement with the members. So I see that um, being brought into ALA, for example. So what we had done in APALA is building upon leaders orientation. So this is actually open to everyone, but especially our committee chairs, our leaders in, in different areas, and they were able to learn and see the governance process and really 
exposed to Robert's Rule of Order, parliamentarian procedures, communication strategy, and engagement with their committees, right? And, 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 and it's so important to, to instill trust and instill that sense of belonging where people can do this work because we believe in them and we want to do this work together. So I have done that through Apala and then I brought it to Kala, which we were um, doing different ways, but not um, virtually engaging. So it worked really well. And now future presidents will be considering this engagement strategy so that our memberships are aware of what we're doing, how we make decisions, what are our core values, what are our mission statement, vision statements, and then being part of that decision-making process too, and being part of this community. So I see, for example, um, ALA being willing to engage in orientations, really dispelling some of the ins and outs. I'm, I have been on council for about, this is my third term, and it's always, so there's always something new to learn and to engage because there's always new people coming in and always making sure that people feel comfortable in the sense of belonging because it's important. If, if they don't have that psychological safety, they might not want to engage. So we want to continue cultivating that and modeling that for other people. And I strive to do that by engaging as much as I can, incorporating folks to be part of this community. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Our next question comes from the Q&A from Donna Forbes, Illinois Prairie District Library in Woodford County, Illinois. How can ALA support libraries creating community partnerships with a goal of creating grassroots support? And Ray, we'll start with you. Thank you. I really appreciate that question because it gives me several responses to, to share out excitingly. The first is that we need to think about, of course, our chapter relations office, our state chapters, and ways to engage with the associations at that level so that they're able to make those engagements because it's a local issue or local interests, right? And, and I think what ALA can do is highlight these stories, highlight these collaborations so that there is more awareness at the national level and then really providing different kinds of resources or support as needed. So I've been recently part of the Weave Speakers Bureau, which is part of the Aspen Institute to ensure that we build community trust through, by telling stories of our communities. So I'm one of the speakers, I'm delighted to be part of this and to see how it works and putting that experience into ALA as ALA president and to help engage with our communities who might have political or cultural differences and to tell our stories. So that means that we could highlight that model for other groups like our state chapters, our affiliates that might have even their own chapters and to engage in these important conversations. There are public programming office at ALA. There are so many grants coming in from ALA that focuses on engaging with the communities, such as racial healing grants that, that came out, you know, and transforming libraries grants. So all of this needs to be communicated. And there's an ecosystem that, that ALA is part of with these groups and to share out so that people have opportunities to engage and partner with different groups to highlight these stories, to, to, to focus on these areas of interest. So I see what we're doing now, but I see a way to continue honoring the good work in different ways where I have been building on these connections and collaborations for so long across ALA and outside of ALA. And I'd be honored to bring that experience and skill into this association and to support the community. Thank you, Ray. Sam? Yeah, like Ray, I'm super jazzed for this question because I've seen us already doing this work with ALA, whether it's through Connect or the Chapter Relations Office or actually in person doing media training, ideating together, we are learning to build containers that will enable those at the local level to essentially combat unprecedented threats to, to libraries' existence and also to censorship. When I think about the opponents of libraries, they have checklists, friends, they have toolkits, they have organized. And so I think that what we can do as ALA is lean into our tools like Connect, our gathering opportunities like the advocacy um, opportunity that we had in Chicago, and really continue to train the trainers and to move this movement out further. So I think United Against Book Bans is excellent and that we have just begun our wonderful work and that we can take the tools that we gathered from the advocacy training, use Connect, and kind of start to build our own toolkits because we know 
the majority of library funding actually comes at a local level. So this is going to support us when we're championing for our library seeking resourcing, but this is also going to support us when we proactively respond to, to the needs. I'll give you an example. When we met with our committee hearing uh, folks who pushed the bill that was essentially canceled this week, I had already prepared a press release after they'd after we'd met to send. So I, I prepared the press release before quoting Senator Green saying that he would remove that library levy piece off. And as soon as I got the quote, I published it because I wanted to make sure that there was a statewide conversation about him keeping library funding for a couple of reasons. It's scary and we already have work to do and we don't need to feel threatened, but I also created some some pressure. These are the types of tools we can teach each other, and I'm really excited to be hands in that work. Thank you, Sam. I'm going to take another question from the Q&A from Shu Hua Lu, the Adult Services Librarian at Santa Clara County Library District in California. The technology of AI is fast advancing. How do you see ALA prepare to embrace or challenge this new technology? Sam, we'll start with you. I think it's about maintaining our structures as an association. Occasionally, I have noted that we feel a little bit behind the curve when it comes to innovation and technological advancement, which sometimes can incite a little bit of nervousness or fear. So I am delighted to represent an association that has deep and broad understanding of the advancements that are coming our way. But I think that as ALA president, my job is to support a structure in order for those those workers, those library members, those divisions, those chapters, those committees to, to continue to do that good work. As a leader at the Iowa City Public Library, I call myself the Community Access Services Librarian, and they're like, what does that mean when I meet members of the community? I say, I resource three great teams, the ones that provide circulation, the ones that provide outreach and bookmobile services, and the ones that create public relations and marketing for our library. So I would lean into my leadership skills to support and research I mean, resource the great teams that are doing this work, but also to apply myself as a leader to learn more about these advancements so that I can speak clearly and, and, and honestly, effectively to them so that we further the mission of the association together. So sometimes leadership is standing back and enabling people to do the work that they are talented and specifically passionate about doing and then applauding and celebrating and amplifying that work. Thank you, Sam. Ray? Thank you, Shuhua and Lessa. This is a really important question. The most important thing to note is that technologies, including AI, is not neutral. I've been part of a lot of different discussions and working groups for over a year discussing how we can think about AI and its ethical considerations, the surveillance, the data collection, the privacy breaching, the, the, the biases that are inherent in these tools. There is nothing artificial in AI. As Fei Fei Li says, it's actually quite reflective of human values and systems, which are unfortunately a lot of biases, right? And a lot of mis and disinformation coming in from AI. So what do I do? So as a teacher educator and a librarian, I, I did the research. I am not an AI or technology expert, but I know that I am a lifelong learner and someone who's always curious and finding ways to ensure that we talk about the ethics and usages of these tools. So working with teachers, working with grad students, working with our teacher educators to come up with an AI usage statement for our syllabi, because we need to be proactive. There are no good or bad, it's all trade-offs with these tools. And it's also a sign that there's a lot of commercialization happening in our library spaces. But that doesn't mean we don't give, give in or give up. We can, an ALA, have partnerships with ACRL focusing on AI literacy, core with their AI working group, or with some of the roundtables interested in workforce development in this area, because it's reflecting all of our work in different ways. And we need to come together to have these conversations. I was invited to give a lot of presentations representing ALA at the Sharjah International Book Fair recently. And people were excited to, talk, to see what ALA library members are doing. And so I think there's really a lot of promise that we can engage thoughtfully and focusing on the ethical considerations because it's out there, but we need to find a way to engage. 
Thank you, Ray. We have time for one more question, and I'm going to ask Marcia to please read a question that was submitted in advance and suggested to from the Q&A back to back. Yes, this is from LA Counselor um, Leah Richardson. What is the role of state library associations chapters in your presidential priorities? Ray, please start us off. Thank you, Leah, for that question. So for me, it's so important to honor those connections that we have and the collaborations between ALA and our state library associations. So as a member of the California Library Associations and part of the Legislative and Advocacy Committee, I have worked for over three years, heading to my fourth year, bridging that connection, what ALA is doing to share that information to CLA and what I've learned from CLA to share it back out to different groups in ALA, such as the ALA Policy Corps and other working groups I'm part of, because it's important that we continue sharing that information. And if people know me, they may have seen a lot of my emails coming into different listservs, and I'll continue doing this work. But in my own presidential campaign and, and vision, I see it playing an important role in expanding the good work of state library associations by providing more, whether that's partner Ships in resource sharing, focusing on specific programs, addressing issues like censorship, job burnout. Are there ways for us to offer trainings and whatnot? So I see that opportunity to, to engage. And this is something I've been thinking about quite often. And I am proud to be part of more and more state chapters as I'm learning from different groups um, besides California, coming in from New York, and really attending future state library conferences as well, so that I get to hear upfront what people are doing locally and what we can do better within ALA. So bringing that information so that we can improve our communication and strengthen our partnerships together because it is not um, just one ALA and state library associations, but rather an ecosystem where we work together, where we define the solutions together as well. So I feel that there are many opportunities and this is something I will continue doing this work in bridging those connections between ALA and state chapters. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Sam? The role of the chapters has already existed for a long time. It's in part to be the hand of the pulse of the profession. They are on the ground facing book challenges and threats and um, honestly just full bore dismantling of, of libraries and defunding. So I feel like in part, we will continue to ask them to be a barometer of the profession for us. What we can do for the chapters is to remind them of the containers, the opportunities, the conversations, the trainings, the tools where we can teach each other. I think that the role of ALA is to unite the chapters. So many of us start at ALA through the chapter associations. And so I think that this is a beautiful opportunity while we are talking about state libraries and we are talking about chapters to remind ourselves that they are microphones who can amplify the good stories of libraries across the globe and amplify the good that ALA contributes and insists happens for our libraries across the globe. I have bragged because I'm from Iowa that we wrote the Freedom to Read, uh, the Bill of Rights, the Library Bill of Rights. Um, it was for Spalding from Des Moines. So it's been very easy for me in my chapter to remind folks that we have a legacy to uphold. And as your president, I would love to take those talking points as a chapter president and remind everybody that we all have an international standard to free people reading freely and that this is a legacy we can continue for 150 years more. I do believe we are going to have to heavily lean into resourcing our values and supporting the chapter relations office with legislative matters more than we ever have before because that is where the legislation is happening. That is where a lot of the funding is happening at the local level. So I believe that our chapters need to continue to shine and that ALA just needs to build a stage for them to sing from their microphones and share our stories because they're important and they're worth sharing. Thank you, Sam and Ray. Our time for questions is now over. Each candidate will have two minutes to make a closing statement. We will begin with presidential candidate, Sam Helmick, then Ray Pun. Sam, please present your closing statement. I will always remember this moment where I sat before ALA membership at a historical time and tried to reconcile whether the next six months of my life I will be on the executive board doing the good work that you have elected me to do as an executive board member, or if I will be on the board for three and a half more years elected to do the good work that you've called me to do. 85 years ago, we adopted the Library Bill of Rights. 
And if we are going to continue to be a free people who read freely, I do ask you to look at my website, samforlibraries.com, review my campaign values, and help me to do this good work together. Essentially, we are going to have to galvanize the entire profession. We are going to have to communicate and communicate and communicate, not only internally, but externally by sharing our good stories. We're going to have to continue to remind ourselves of our wins because librarianship can always feel like a Sisyphean sensation. There's always one more bill. There's always one more class. There's always one more ask. There's always one more social safety net that has been ripped and now tossed into libraries. And so by sharing our stories, we will continue to be inspired to do this good work. But by sharing our stories, we are going to invite, I'm going to say gently insist by joyful offense that folks around the globe join us in this good work and that we develop mechanisms for them to resource us, not only with their dollars, but with their words and with their actions. As your presidency, uh, as your president, I will be an advocate for libraries. I will amplify your stories and I will call with you to do this work shoulder to shoulder. I thank you for your consideration, and I ask that you vote for me and, uh, and do this good work with me. Thank you, Sam. I now call upon presidential candidate Ray Pun to present a closing statement. Ray? Thank you, Lessa. I'm honored to be considered for ALA president, and I'd like to start off with a quote from author Toni Morrison. Quote, if you are free, you need to free somebody. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else, end of quote. I'm speaking to you all today because we believe in the power of libraries and library workers in transforming opportunities for each other and for our communities, especially bringing people together from all walks of life in a shared and inclusive space. I've been given numerous opportunities and now I always seek to pay it forward to bring people together and empower others within the profession. As a library leader who is a champion of equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility, and who has been involved across and outside of this association, I see opportunities for us at ALA to collaborate for a better future. As I shared my goals earlier, we need to work together to highlight the perceived invisible labor that library workers are experiencing, to share narratives and best practices that elevate our presence in addressing today's numerous challenges. We also must build stronger relationships between ALA, members, state and regional chapters, and affiliates here and around the world, leading up to ALA's 150th anniversary. Finally, strengthening ALA's role in bridging global networks is critical. Over 350 languages are spoken in America, and there are opportunities to collaborate with libraries and library workers, supporting indigenous groups, immigrants, asylum seekers, refugees, international students, migrants, and multilingual speakers. Our profession is rapidly changing, but we have the opportunity to collaborate and calibrate our worth, values, and areas together. I encourage you to join me to support these efforts. And to learn more, you can visit raypon.info. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, Sam. This concludes the 2024 ALA Virtual Presidential Candidates Forum. It has been my absolute pleasure to moderate this forum. I would like to thank our candidates and all of you who came to hear them. Again, immediately following today's forum is an informal 30-minute Meet the Candidate virtual session. To register for this session, please click on the registration link provided in the chat. ALA members will have the opportunity to meet with the ALA presidential candidates. Each candidate will be in a breakout room and attendees will have the opportunity to visit the different rooms to become an informed voter. Electronic balloting will begin on March 11th, 2024. Polls will close on April 3rd. We will know the results of the election on April 8th. I encourage all ALA members to vote. One of your member benefits is to vote for the association's future member leaders. The 2024 election is an important opportunity for your voice to be heard. Again, thank you for attending the forum and have a great time at the meet and greets.